Hello, and welcome back to The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's Bea, and today you will be joining me with part two of the episode with Dr. Matthias Schmidt on the science of stress. Yesterday, we came out with part one, where we talk about what exactly stress is, why different people are more stress vulnerable, what kind of genetic factors and genes make us more stress vulnerable, and what diseases stress can cause, in particular, metabolic and psychiatric disorders. Today, we will talk more about what tools and treatments can be used to prevent stress, how lifestyle changes can reduce our stress levels. In particular, we look at the role of exercise and nutrition. We will also talk about how we can mitigate our own stress and help others mitigate their stress. And last but not least, we talk about the impact that COVID has had on our stress levels. So let's get started and continue this podcast on the science of stress. So you've been talking about finding drugs that can influence the expression of FK BP51. So is there also some ways that maybe through environmental factors or lifestyle changes, we can also influence the amount that FK BP51 is expressed? Absolutely. So uh, there's uh, things in your lifestyle and things that everyone can do, which we are at least researching on, would be able to, on the one hand, manipulate FKPP51, but also other factors in your body which are pro-resilient, which is not only, obviously, FKPP51 is one example. It's basically one screw we can we can tighten or loosen a little bit and, and basically shift your resilience, but there's many other screws one could take and, and get a similar effect. And, and we actually just applied for a research proposal uh, with a large European uh, consortium where we want to look at the um, effects of autophagy on resiliency. And autophagy is a system or is a process which, which is really, really interesting. It is basically the recycling system of your body, uh, eating up uh, all um, the unused proteins and organelles which are not used anymore. And there is uh, surprisingly a lot of evidence already indicating that differential, like a dysregulated autophagy is related to stress and is related to stress-related disorders, is related to differential brain function and synaptic function in the brain and so forth. So there's a lot of indications that autophagy stimulation might be actually quite beneficial for individuals. And things that boost autophagy in the body are, for example, exercise. So if you want to increase, I mean, th there is still uh, limited evidence that this is really uh, increasing individual resilience and can be used to to have like a pro-resilient effect. But this is what we now applied for. If you get funded, we will study this with large human cohorts, but also with animal models, uh, whether this is really the case. But there's already good indications that this might work. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't start this research. So we, we believe that things like exercise and specific forms, for example, or also dietary interventions. Uh, a classical example is the interval fasting, which, uh, which has been shown to uh, increase autophagy. There's also so certain food supplements which uh, are not necessarily um, drugs because they're they're available in, in, in food in general. But if you enhance those and then give those as supplements, you can also increase autophagy. So all of these would be possibilities where you wouldn't need to necessarily take a specific drug which you get prescribed by a doctor, but which basically enable you um, to increase individual resilience on a day-to-day -day basis and be more preventive if you want uh, for your mental and physical health. It's a very nice explanation yet that you just gave also linking autophagy because when someone asks, tells me like I'm stressed or when I feel stressed myself, what I like to do is I like to go exercise and that helps me uh, kind of release my stress. And I, you've just gave, given a really nice like biological explanation for why that's actually the case and why exercise helps uh, me. And I'm sure that would also help a lot of other people. Um, and so, yeah, do you think that maybe we should be talking more about kind of the effect of nutrition and exercise 
as ways to treat stress or stress-related disorders such as depression? Or do you think that in general, a lot of people are talking about it and we're doing enough of that and we should be moving into more uh, like the drugs and taking drugs to help treat these kind of disorders? I don't think there's enough uh, discussion on either of those two topics. So uh, on the one hand, I mean, we um, now all experienced um, with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, a very severe and basically worldwide uncontrollable stress situation. Uh, for many people, uh, it was like this. And there was a lot of, you know, sense of losing control of higher stress levels. And there is already uh, now in the last uh, two years data emerging uh, from different countries across the world showing quite conclusively that this this pandemic led to a higher incidence of stress-related psychiatric and other stress-related disorders. So we have a clear example that uh, it is absolutely essential to enable citizens at large to proactively increase their resilience because you cannot wait always. You do not want to wait until a disorder arrives at your doorstep and, and then treatment is going to be much more difficult. And you want to be and empower people basically to take pro-resilient steps and think about uh, what things in their life they can already change to be more resilient and to build up more resilience. Um, some you know some things seem natural so you think you know sport exercise uh, cannot be bad but research on this uh, can actually help guide this what kind of exercise how long how much in which intervals for example uh, we can try to optimize this we can try to uh, induce um, technology like wearables which measure your stress level that the individual stress level not only uh, the classical ones where, where people uh, have you know maybe the heartbeat measured or something but uh, there's also room to develop more complex and more sensitive uh, wearable devices which then really can measure different aspects of the stress system of an individual and give very direct advice or guidelines to say, okay, do more of this or do more of that. So I think uh, this is the direction we, we need to go. In addition to also developing um, pharmacological treatments, which are then very specific for, for certain uh, patients which suffer from a disorder uh, and where this prevention has not worked, which will always, I think, be the case. You will not be able to prevent uh, fully uh, stress-related disorders. But it would already be, I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of people which are suffering from depression every year. If we could reduce this number, at the moment it's steadily on the rise. If we can reduce it only by 1%, uh, this would already be a major breakthrough uh, saying, okay, we we provided people with more resiliency and that's why we have 1% or 2% less uh, patients of this disorder, this would help thousands and thousands of people. Uh, yeah, I mean, also exercise is free. Like anyone has access to it. Everyone can do it. So that'd be a great preventative treatment if it works. Like I do appreciate that I'm talking in general terms. And of course, it might work very well for some people, not for others. So I definitely do appreciate that. But um, is there also some kind of research that tells us like what type of exercise would be best? Yes, exactly. So this is what now is going on with you, uh, or what we are currently planning. And I'm sure other people uh, in other labs uh, in the world are also looking into this at the moment to really test what kind of exercise, what duration, what intensity uh, can actually be helpful also in the different stress-related disorders. You can do this for depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or other types of disorders. Um, it may also depend a little bit on the disorder whether this is highly applicable. So uh, for a patient suffering from severe depression, um, there's going to be different forms of exercise or intervention possible than for someone suffering from, let's say, obesity or something else. Also, because there's other you know issues at hand in terms of motivation, in terms of uh, hedonic responses of a of, of person. So this needs to be adapted for the symptoms for the disorder, and then also to see what is helpful in one does not necessarily meet uh, need to be the most helpful in another disorder. And so can you already tell us like what the research has showed or has the research not been done yet 
that kind of tells us specifically what exercise would be helpful? There, there's certain uh, research which already has been performed showing, for example, that certain types of uh, aerobic exercises are beneficial for a certain type of disorder. But I think this would go into too much detail. There is not a single, um, at, at the moment, we, we know too little to say, okay, this is the type of exercise you would need to do and this is the intensity. The data are currently being gathered. Some of the studies are still relatively small. Uh, which are you know kind of pilot studies saying okay this did work in this one study now we have to confirm this in a bigger cohort and seeing how this actually works in a larger population so um, we will have to see in the next couple of years what what the results what what results can be confirmed but the idea really is that at some point we will have guidelines where we are relatively certain if you follow those that you can there's a scientific basis for saying okay this uh, kind of lifestyle, this kind of intervention will increase your average uh, resiliency to stress-related disorders. So I definitely want to uh, keep on talking about also ways that we can mitigate our stress. But before we move into that, I did want to ask a question, which I'm not sure if I'm thinking about this in the correct way. But so say we just injected like large amounts of cortisol in our body constantly throughout would we also be seeing like higher rates of psychiatric disorders and um, metabolic disorders develop? Yes. Or is it specific to like the, the response that your body gives like and dependent on the external or internal stimuli? It's, it's actually both. So uh, what you're talking about, there is a disorder called Cushing's disease, which uh, is usually uh, related to a tumor in the stress axis, which results in a constant overproduction of cortisol and Cushing's, I mean, I'm not a physician, I'm not a doctor, but the Cushing's disease patients have metabolic disturbances, uh, um, which is very clear. And they also have a higher incidence, much higher incidence of other psychiatric disorders as, for example, depression. So uh, it is not that, again... As with stress in general, not every of these patients will develop this, but there's a clear, uh, clear cut effect. So if you just uh, give um, a person or an animal by that, uh, uh, by that means uh, high levels of stress hormone constantly, you will change the physiology and their behavior, uh, and this will result in higher incidence of stress related disorders. On the other hand, stress is not the same as only cortisol um, release. So in a stress response, there's different systems in the body uh, which release different hormones. And cortisol is one of the major ones and the very important ones. But there's also many other things which are going on independent of uh, cortisol in the body following a stress response. So it's too simplistic to say stress is cortisol. because um, yeah, exercise will increase cortisol quite dramatically, actually, again, in a, of course, time restricted and controllable manner, uh, but it will it will do so. And but other things are going on as well. There's a lot of neurotransmitters which are released in the brain. There is uh, the sympathetic nervous system, which people as if, when you talk about stress, this is actually something you can feel. So your adrenaline level, which is another stress axis in your body, which is even faster than the one which was related to cortisol release. This is something which goes on within seconds, and everyone kind of can feel this because if there is an adrenaline rush, you know how that feels like. Your your blood starts pumping, your your heart starts racing, you start sweating. Um, those those are the first physical or physiological reactions to another stress hormone. In this case, uh, adrenaline. So to say stress is only cortisol is definitely also not correct and it's too simplistic. So we will not be able to treat everything uh, by just treating cortisol uh, signaling, but we can definitely contribute a lot to, to the stress effects when we manipulate at this, at this interface. And something that really interests me as well, and I think I always get it wrong, is that I use the term anxiety and stress interchangeably. Um, but I do think that on a biological level, or at least I would assume they are different. So what are the differences? That's a good point. So anxiety... And stress, I would not in, use them interchangeably. Anxiety is a behavioral trait. 
Um, so you can be more or less anxious in a certain situation. There's also anxiety related disorders, um, which, for example, include uh, social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. These are all disorders from the group of anxiety disorders. Um, it is true that stress is also a major risk factor for anxiety disorders. Um, and probably also true that patients suffering from an anxiety disorder often have a dysregulated um, stress hormone system. But where the stress and the stress response is really a biological system and phenomenon, the anxiety is really more like a behavioral expression um, that, that you have in a certain situation. Yeah. So I would not call, use that interchangeably. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Because actually, I, I also hear it a lot from other people. It's like, oh, I'm anxious to go to this person. But then someone might say, but I'm stressed to go to, to be in this situation. And so I feel like, yeah, I use it. I used to think it's the same, but it's a good explanation. It, it is. I mean, this is absolutely true. Um, if you are in, in a highly anxious situation, so if, if you are in a situation which makes you anxious, very, very likely this also increases the stress system activity. On the other hand, not every stress system activity, not everything which increases your stress also makes you anxious. So this is, I think, the distinction. One is usually uh, coupled to the other, but not necessarily the other way around. So if you go on exercise, if you um, if you go to the sauna, to take the earlier example, uh, you will have a stress response, but you will most likely not be anxious in that situation. Yes, yeah, so on a biological level, like they are completely different. Yes. Um, yeah, and you would also be able to, if, if someone comes to you, you and you like measure their hormone levels or something, then you would obviously just be looking at how stressed they are. But with anxiety, you can't really look at their hormone responses or levels. I mean, they're different. The hormone responses and anxiety will be different, but you cannot use them to diagnose anxiety. So, you know, you cannot just measure the hormone and say, oh, this was a very anxious person or animal. You'd have to actually observe them and, and talk to them or observe them in a test situation. Also, the, the brain regions which regulate anxiety and stress they're linked to each other, but they're not necessarily the same. So anxiety, for example, is regulated in the amygdala and in, in the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. So there are certain, in the ventral hippocampus, there are certain areas which, uh, which are known to regulate anxiety level in, in, in the brain. Uh, the stress system is uh, the, the core of the stress system, at least in the in the brain, is in the hypothalamus, which is a different region. It is connected to also the anxiety regions in the brain, so that there is a lot of interplay with each other, and also stress hormones will affect these anxiety-related brain regions. But you know, anatomically, at least, they are still distinct. Um, and so then this leads me on to one of the hardest topics, in my opinion, which is how can we help people mitigate stress and how can we help ourselves mitigate our stress? And I find this so hard because sometimes I have people that come to me or I go to someone and I tell them, oh, I'm, I'm really stressed. Like, what should I do? And it's really hard sometimes to answer because, like you said, one one person might be able to do this and that can help them uh, regulate or mitigate their stress, but that might not work for someone else. So yeah. Do you have any comments on this? Like I'm not asking you to play clinician or anything. Cause I also know that you're not a clinician, um, but yeah, maybe you can add something to this. I, I can try. So obviously whenever uh, my friends or people I meet and I talk about my work, uh, which I really love, and then I tell them I'll work about stress. This is obviously a question which comes up quite often that people say, Oh, I'm so stressed actually, you know, can you give me any advice what to do? Um, as you said, I'm not a clinician, so uh, I cannot give any clinical advice. But in general, I'll come back to what I said in the beginning. The stress per se is actually quite a good thing, but you have to make sure uh, from the data that we have uh, that it is controllable and potentially avoidable. So when people tell me that they are stressed, then I'm basically uh, ask, trying to ask them what kind of stress is it? and what is causing this and what would be your options to to control 
distress situation, not necessarily lessen it. Sometimes this is impossible, but to basically have a level of control over this. So in, in many cases, I found out that uh, people think a situation is uncontrollable and uh, out of their control and they cannot do anything about it, just have to live through it. But at the end of the day, this is not the case. So it, it may just be a bigger hurdle. So to say, you know, I'm in a toxic relationship since 20 years, uh, but I kind of have to stay in that for the next 20 years. Uh, this, you know, you may feel like this, but there's actually ways uh, you can address this proactively and say, what can I do to to have a control over that situation? Similarly, with job issues or time pressure issues, and and you will often find that. People say, I'm so stressed in my job and, uh, you know, I don't want to advise everyone to kind of switch their jobs. But if it's really something which affects your health and may affect your health, then I think people should take uh, sometimes also more, um, yeah, to be more more proactive in, and, and don't shy away from more drastic decisions saying, okay, my health should be the most important people. I, you see people all the time that, that, that kind of, are in a bad place that are under a lot of stress and don't have uh, the capacity or the guidance to change this and then a couple of years later they do suffer from a stress related disorder which will uh, be very um, affecting them and affecting their family and their friends around them uh, stress related disorders like psychiatric disorders are super uh, impactful on the personal individual but also on the on the people around them so uh, it is worthwhile thinking about early on how can an individual um, navigate through this and how can you make a situation more controllable, more uh, manageable in a sense. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the hardest parts is though that like a lot of the times at the beginning when you're experiencing a lot of stress, maybe you don't speak up about it. And then only at the end when it really becomes like you yourself cannot manage it anymore, then you start speaking up about it. And then it might be too late to take control yourself over the situation. Um, so do you also recommend like talking to people about it or if, if you yourself cannot manage the situation? Absolutely. So social, I didn't talk about this much yet, but the social surroundings and your social um, structure in your life uh, is very, very important to control um, to control uh, stress and stress resilience and the stress response in general. So um, there is also a lot of studies uh, in animals and in humans about social buffering and how social partners and, and good social interactions can uh, very much buffer your stress response and, and, and lead you to be more resilient. On the same time, social strains or social conflicts are, are one of the most strongest uh, stressors that we know of much stronger than many of the physical stressors that we know so um, to use this knowledge and to actually engage your social network and your social your friends your family and whatnot um, and talk about this uh, and and try to find try try to not you know do things always on your own but to actually engage in this social network i think this is really important and and that's why it's i think also very important to fight this this stigma this dogma that that uh that psychiatric disorders or stress related disorders are something uh, to be you know where people say oh this is, might be something to be ashamed of which is absolutely not you know if you suffer from uh, heart disease or diabetes which is also stress related but you know there uh, the generally people will not say oh this is you know this is your own fault and you, you're not supposed to you don't think you want to talk about it but for psychiatric disorders specifically there is still this general um you know sense i think in the in the population there is there is something that 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 people may have caused themselves or or that their their own responsibility to, you know they just need to have a bit more resilience in their life but there's actual biological mechanisms behind this and often people cannot 
you know, the one may be lucky with a certain genetic background, another one may not be so lucky, but there's biological mechanisms underlying the psychiatric disorders. And to fight and to proactively talk about this also in the society and in in, 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 in the news and wherever, you know, we basically encounter this, this is really, really important to allow people to also openly express of course, once they're suffering from a psychiatric disorder, but already before, if there is a first sign of of being uh, too stressed to suffer, for example, like the, from the beginning of a burnout syndrome, where you go like, okay, this is really the point uh, to reach out and to share this with people and to try to seek help also in your social surroundings. Actually, something we haven't really talked about is the kind of symptoms that people feel when they're stressed. And what are the first signs of someone uh, developing chronic stress. So, what are what are some of those symptoms? Yeah, th- this is this is difficult, and, and it's difficult in the sense that uh, a high activity of your stressless stress system, specifically this uh, cortisol release, is not something you you easily feel or detect. It's different from adrenaline, where you know, okay, there's now a lot of adrenaline. You feel there's something different, but for stress, it is not. So uh, often, if you it's it's the, the symptoms are more subtle there's changes in behavior it may also actually be something which which might be more detected not by yourself but by your surroundings so i think it's also the task or the the, the duty of of friends and people around you to not shy away of saying look i i had the feeling you changed in the in the recent months you're behaving differently you're not going out so much anymore you um you know your behavior generally changed or your attitude changed what's going on maybe we can talk about this so um it, it's i think quite hard to define there's there is of course physiological changes which happen with stress as well um on all kinds of levels um but i i, I wouldn't say okay look for you know changes in your skin quality or you know, losing hair or something. These are obviously at least theoretical aspects which might happen if you're in a lot of stress, but I wouldn't wait for those to happen to to then say... I mean, one thing which is definitely true is that the, the immune system is one of the first indicators uh, that something is, is, is not right because it's very much linked to the stress system. So if you, for example, uh, get more sick more often or you have like little things that, that you didn't have before, like, um, I don't know, any, anything where you go like, okay, this is, uh, I used to be much more resilient also in terms of uh, getting sick and now i get all kinds of disorders every flu which comes along i i kind of also catch it so this would be a first warning sign i would say if your immune system is not functioning properly it might be due to a too high level of stress as well um so of course correct me now if i'm wrong but i think that stress nowadays tends to be maybe diagnosed by like a feeling that you have or by talking about it. So if you, I don't know, went to go see a doctor and you told them something's wrong um, and they would say, oh, it seems like, you know, you have depression or you have high levels of stress. It, I think it's just by like talking about how you're feeling. But could you maybe start doing like hormonal tests or other kind of tests on a bio- biological level to confirm that you might be developing chronic stress? This would be what we want to achieve at the moment. This is unfortunately not the case yet. So we do have a first set of biological tests, which we know are on average altered in stress-related disorders, like, for example, depression. They're not sensitive enough on their own to use them vice versa and say, this is a diagnostic tool like we have for diabetes, like diabetes, I know I, I just measure blood glucose, and once I'm above a certain level, I can say, okay, this qualifies your diabetic, right? Um, we do not have something like this in psychiatry. So, uh, and this is actually why there's a lot of research now looking um, at biosignatures where you do not have just one measurement, but a combination of measurements to, in addition to the interview type of diagnosis, which is currently the only uh, available tool that we have, is to look to, to basically talk to individuals and say, okay, I, you know, I go through a list of, of ratings and, and, and scales and, and then basically come up with a diagnosis like this. 
because an individual fulfills a certain set of criteria which then in combination are defined okay this is uh, uh, consistent with suffering from depression but what we would like to have is biological markers which as you said confirm this not only confirm this in the diagnosis but then also can be used for treatment uh, efficacy for example that's another thing so at the moment uh, there's very little, if any, options to, in advance, tell uh, as a doctor, is a certain drug or intervention going to be successful, yes or no. We, there's a certain likelihood of maybe 50% that the drug's working, but I'll only know a couple of weeks later once the person has given has been given the drug, and it's a little bit trial and error. So what we would like to get you know, two is is a situation where, based on a biosignature, we take in, together with the interview and the diagnosed interview uh, to make a more informed decision and say, okay, with this treatment, I have a much higher likelihood to treat successfully, and I can also monitor the tr- treatment success not only with interviews on a weekly basis, but maybe also with some measurements that I can say, okay, which may even be earlier, ideally the measurements the biological parameters that i assess are responding first and then the symptom relief may come second right so then we would already know the drug is working or the drug's not working i don't have to wait for weeks and weeks until i finally see a behavioral effect so this but this is unfortunately something which is not currently state of the art if you would suffer from depression today you would still uh be faced uh, w- with uh with basically a lot of trial and error and would hope that, that things are working out for you. Uh, but th- every researcher which is working on this, including us, is trying very hard to find these mechanisms and to find these biomarkers and and define them and then test them whether they can actually be used in this predictive way. Wow, that's extremely fascinating. So how far away, how many years, in how many years do you think we're going to see such kind of... Um, yeah, treatments taking place or diagnosis. Hopefully, it's not going to take too long to at least, I mean, people are already starting in this direction, uh, but we definitely have a long way to go until this is general practice and, and really shows uh, clear effects and is applied to most of the patients seeing uh, seeing a doctor. There's, there's also, of course, speci- specifically for psychiatric disorders, there's the big problem of undiagnosed uh, individuals which do not even go to the doctor, which suffer from a disorder uh, without having the diagnosis and without having the treatment. But at least for the ones who, who end up being treated, um, we're we're going in this direction. There's a lot of research and efforts worldwide from clinicians and also from preclinical scientists like me looking in this direction and trying to, to make progress there. But until it really reaches widespread application, we'll still be quite some years until until we get there. And so do you think that we are more stress vulnerable nowadays to what we used to be or have have the levels stayed the same or are we maybe less stress vulnerable than we used to be? Yeah, that's a di- not so easy and maybe a little bit phys- uh, philosophical question um, because of different things at play. So this, the kinds of stressors which um, people used to face um, in more prehistoric times were very different to the stressors that we're currently facing. Um, we, you could also argue that if you're constantly um, stressed by you know, being chased down and eaten by some predators or dying from hunger or cold in the winter, that um, this is different level of stress, and but also different level of dealing with the stress. Maybe also a little bit a different level of controllability. So you can um, you can deal with these stressors maybe a little better by you know preparing for a cold winter or you know working hard to to protect yourself uh, in your village where you live and so forth. So uh, I'm not 100 percent sure. Maybe there's people working on this uh, how. Uh, the incidence of, of, of stress-related disorders may have been different uh, a long time ago during human evolution, also because uh, let's not forget that the lifespan of humans is much increased now. So 
um, some of the disorders that we're currently suffering from a lot during adulthood and, and aging may not have been so prevalent early on because uh, life expectancy wasn't as long and uh, and people didn't live that much and that long. So, But I also think that the kind of stressors really matter and that what we have to evolved with and to deal with in terms of stress uh, stress response is is different to what we nowadays um, face. I mean, it starts with school. It doesn't start with school, but school is a nice example that, you know, if you have a, a very stressful time during uh, growing up in school, your stress response enables you to run away fast and to, to, to deal with those kind of challenges may not be so adaptive uh, to actually increase your resilience in the school where there's a lot of rules and you have to sit through your classes and be very attentive. So I think the evolutionary conserved mechanisms of your stress response not always match which what with the challenges that we have nowadays. And this may also be one of the reasons why stress-related disorders are so on the rise, because the challenges are just different and maybe also in a certain extent less controllable. Yeah, something that I've also thought about is that... Um... Like in the past, we always used to live in much smaller communities, whereas nowadays we live in such large communities and maybe our body just isn't as stress adapted to deal with so many people around us and so many things going on. Um, but yeah. Um, and then the last question that I did really want to talk to you about, and we've touched on it a bit at the beginning, was COVID and how COVID has, what, what, what COVID has done to the amount of stress that people feel. And kind of the long-term consequences of COVID as well. Yeah, the long-term consequences we don't know yet. Um, but uh, you know, aside from the negative impact for the individual suffering from COVID, it is really um, the, the stress and the uncontrollability of the situation, which which nearly affected everyone. Uh, this was an unprecedented situation, I would say, where worldwide people were confronted with this and uh, and there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things out of control basically where you felt that you know if the situation goes like this the incidence rate rises you you know you may lose your job you you may you know you may be infected yourself suffering you have your family kids to worry about so there's a lot of additional stress which on top of everything else we already have good reason to be stressed about and as i said in the beginning this has led to a dramatic rise in stress-related psychiatric and other stress-related disorders so um with this uh you know also maybe from my side a shout out to get vaccinated because uh this is one thing everyone can do uh, in that specific sort of a stressor this is something uh, everyone can do to help for yourself, but also for society to uh, to reduce the stress level and to at least reduce this and, and get out, get rid basically of this sort of stressor. But uh, we have now the tool science was doing a tremendous job uh, in developing these these vaccines, um, and now it's just up to the people to take this free offer and, and get vaccinated. And everyone should do their part uh, and and support the whole society with this because otherwise uh, they're not only responsible for their own health uh, later on but they're also responsible for all the downstream effects and all the uh, secondary effects we have for example related to the stress and the psychiatric disorders which arise from this yeah and so if a future pandemic would hit um and we would experience something similar what do you think that we could do to reduce the amount the, the increased rate of stress that we're seeing now with this pandemic? There is already some st studies in that direction, but very few of people in, I mean, previous pandemics, which were maybe more local, which were asking the questions, how can we uh, train people to deal with such situations better? And it all boils down again to increasing awareness and and managing uh, such a stress situation better being better prepared and thereby being more resilient in terms of because you're more prepared and you can control the situation better so if a second pandemic would hit uh, hopefully people would be better prepared to this because they know what can i do to counteract this you know and and then listen to 
basically this the scientists uh, advice and say uh, I, I you know to be honest i was quite shocked that we had uh, to discuss at the beginning of the pandemic w whether or not uh, wearing a mask can be beneficial there is tons of data from from uh, other regions in the world which already had more locally restricted pandemics and where there was absolutely clear data that mask wearing is beneficial which was something we had very early on in our hands to do and was just a big big hurdle for everyone to get over with that this is actually something which is helpful and now uh, i think everyone most people agree that yes it is helpful and this is something we can do and it's relatively simple and everyone can do it like exercise so enable people to take their anti-stress measures in their own hand this is i think uh, what we need to work in the direction also you know pre-train people in case something similar happens what are the measures they can take without being told that this is something they need to do yeah yeah i agree and uh, it would be nice i think now to to end on that note um so again thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking to us about such a important and prominent topic that i think a lot of people can relate to um so yeah thanks again we really enjoyed it and i actually really hope the audience enjoyed it as well thanks so much it was a pleasure so that's it thank you all for listening i really hope that some of you may have learned something that can help them mitigate their stress or help you help others mitigate their stress I think this is such an important issue, especially with stress-related diseases being on the rise. So please t keep talking and discussing stress. Keep learning about it, especially on a biological level where so much is still unknown. And if you're interested in this kind of topic, share this podcast with whoever you think would be interested in learning about the science behind stress. If you like our podcasts, make sure to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And make sure to follow Matthias Schmidt on Twitter to stay up to date with his research. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck's PhD Nets Science Communication Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Rankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.